I remember dropping him off and being like, I don't know if I'm ever gonna see my husband again. It was just not getting any better and I stayed on the COVID ward for at least, what was it, 10 days? They came to me and said, Mr. Hyde, if we don't put you on the ventilator, we are concerned that you, we are gonna lose you. My heart just dropped and all of a sudden I hear a nurse and she's like, do you want the cart? And I was like, holy cow, that's a crash cart. Like that's, that's his heart. Like what's going on? Like that's legitimately life threatening now. We have COVID, we have this heart thing and strokes. And so I'm not gonna give up hope and God can do a miracle. God touched every single thing and healed you. There is so much more glory being going to the Lord through me doing nothing and being in a hospital bed. When we're weak, God is infinitely strong. If you have breath in your lungs, you can serve the Lord. I'm Mark Hyde, and this is my wife. I'm Kathy Hyde. Yeah, and we've been married for 28 years. Um, we've got four kids, and um, we're going to tell our story about the miracle that God did for us um, and how he moved and how he showed his power and his name was glorified and he demonstrated his love for us again and again and again. The story starts end of August 2021. Mm -hmm. um, Mark went to his um, annual uh, fantasy football draft yeah. <laughs> and it was in person and um, he went and had a great time, and then a couple of days after that, he, um, I think you heard that somebody that had been there had tested positive for COVID, yeah. and then like Tuesday, Wednesday-ish, he started not feeling well. Mm -hmm. There was two days, and uh, finally we were like, well, work um, requirements or whatever required that he test um, to see yeah. if he was positive. And so he tested and he came back positive. And so we did the whole quarantine thing. He stayed in the basement of the, you know, how we were supposed to yeah. be quarantined. And, um, so that was first or second of September. And it wasn't, it wasn't too bad at first. Like it was progressive. I think a lot of people experienced that with COVID. Um, it was just, you know, this and that symptoms and then it got worse. And, um, it started becoming more difficult to take deep breaths is what I experienced. September 9th was the girl's first day of school. And so, you know, obviously we had been quarantining and so he, he couldn't, um, be up with them, but he was going to come, he was in the basement. So he was going to come around and just wave to them for the first day of school. Mm -hmm. And, um, Willow had, had, walked out the door before me and all of a sudden she came running back to me and yeah. was like mom daddy passed out daddy passed out I took off running to the back of the house and he had had passed out a second time um when I got there and was still I don't know if you were 100 percent conscious by the time yeah. I got back there and I I panicked <laughs> um because I don't think I realized at that point that um that could be one of the symptoms if you have a blood clot you know and you could and from COVID that it was a COVID, um, symptom. Um, so I panicked <laughs> and didn't know what to do because you did come to pretty quick. And so I was like, this isn't a, an ambulance emergency. Um, but we need help. And so we ended up calling the doctor, I believe, and asking what we should do. Could yeah. we go to the doctor or what? And he recommended that we go to the, um, the walk-in clinic. And there's one specific one again, because it was COVID time. Um, that we went to the COVID, uh, COVID uh, walk-in clinic and then they checked him there yeah. and sent us to the ER and they were like, oh, you're fine. You just need um, to be uh, hydrated. hydrated. Mm -hmm. So they put you on an IV and hydrated you. Yeah. And I was um, passing out. Was I've never passed out before. That was the first time. And um, I remember standing at the door and feeling like things were... We're moving, and next thing I knew, I was on the pay, on the concrete, with my head on a piece of wood that is near our front door, our back door, and um, yeah, and then the whole story of going to the ER, and they sent me home. Yep. And I was still not breathing. It was hard breathing. That was the biggest deal. Was I couldn't really get a breath. My oxygen, 
I think a lot of people bought those little pulse ox things during oh, COVID. Don't. Um, bad idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I was obsessed with that thing. I would look at bad it all idea. the time. But I was watching mine drop to like 95, 94, 92, 90, high 80s. And that's bad. And that's what my doctor said. Um, I called him at some and said, I, my, 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 and he said, if it gets to like high 80s, you need to, need to go to the ER. So that was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And so he, like he said, he got sent home. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we continued doing what we'd been doing, which was pretty much nothing. (laughs) Um, we had asked for ivermectin and I forget what the other one was. Yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. Doctors were like, no. And we got denied both of those by the doctor. Um, so we were, we, and they gave you, I forget what that, that, um, Z-Pack. Z-Pack. Yeah. Z-Pack. Z-Pack. Yeah. They gave you a Z-Pack. That did nothing. Um, and so we just kept doing what we were yeah. doing and, and thinking like, you know, he had um, tested positive around the first or the second. And so we're getting on to like this by Sunday it was the 12th. So, you know, we're getting on to the 10 day mark, you know, and that seemed to be like. I don't know why. I don't know if it was because of the news or what, but in my mind, 10 days was was the magic number. Should have started getting better by then. Yeah. But eventually, it was time to go to the ER. So I um, went to, in the car, and Kathy couldn't come in with me. You guys remember how that was yeah. then? So I went in, sat in the waiting room. They brought me back. They took me up to the COVID ward, admitted me. And it was a very interesting time because they didn't even know what they were doing, like medicine at that mm-hmm. point in time. So it was like, try this, try that. And they were given the, the nasal cannula and they were given the big, whatever that big machine, that CPAP, mm-hmm. what they call that. And they were trying to, you know, shoot oxygen up, up my nose and stuff. It was just not getting any better. And I stayed on the COVID ward for at least, what was it, 10 days? Well, so I dropped you off on the 12th because your oxygen was so low. So low, yeah. Um, and, and that was dramatic because I couldn't, I wasn't supposed to hug him or what, you know, cause it was still that. So it was, but I didn't know, like, I remember dropping him off and being like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see my husband again. Yeah. Like it was just this very surreal moment and stupid because I didn't hug you. And yet at the same time knew that I might not ever see him again, but hopeful still, obviously, mm-hmm. um, but then that was on the 12th and then on the 21st. So however yeah. many days that is. I'll jump in. Um, so I, on the 21st was a big day for us because that's the day we went on the ventilator. And if, for people that are watching this, I mean, I'm sure they have people in their families who, um, who went on the ventilator. It's a, it's a very serious thing. At COVID, like at COVID, at that time, if you went on the ventilator, they're like, you have 1% chance of survival. Um, and the longer you're on it, the worst, the worst your chances are. I mean, how much worse can you get than 1%, right? Yeah. They came to me at some point and I was seriously, I remember breathing was like, I, like just, I, it's hard to demonstrate it, but, um, I, I couldn't get a breath at all. And I was on the phone with Kathy. Um, they came to me and said, Mr. Hyde, if we don't put you on the ventilator, we are concerned that you, we are going to lose you. You're not going to make it. And I had a, a good amount of anxiety at that point. And they were trying to trust the Lord through all of this, like all of this, praying and asking the Lord to deliver us from it. We didn't, no one wants to go through with that. It was his will for us to go through it. And so I told the doctor, I want to talk to Kathy. They said, well, we'll try to get her, her here Um, and I, she was going to jump in the car and come. Um, but while she was on route and again, this is some of this, I'm telling your story because I was already like not really cognizant about what was going on. Like all I knew is that I was just asked if I told I needed to go on the ventilator and they needed consent. So they're like, sorry, we can't wait. And I said, if doc, if that's what you need to do to save my life, do it. The next thing I remember is the mask going on my face, um, the put me to sleep mask, the knockout gas, whatever it is, and um, out I went. And um, I'll 
that this part of the story did my wife because I was unconscious for like out for on the ventilator for four weeks. Um, and, um, and then they, when I started, when they started waking me up, I was on it for another week and a half just as they weed me off. But you, I don't know if we just want to testify what God, how God took care of you during that time. Cause everything was on you. I was absolutely out. September 21st. Again, I was hopeful because it had been, you know, 20 ish days since he had first been, um, tested positive. And, um, we had hoped originally that he would get come home for our daughter's birthday, which was on the 19th, and, and that didn't happen because we were on the 21st. And so I got a phone call, and I had just finished my run, and I was, you know, the endorphins were pumping, and I was excited, and I was like, you're going to hear from him. And I was like, maybe today is the day he's going to come home. And um, I, it was a FaceTime, and I saw his face, and the first thing he said was, it's not good. And, and my heart just dropped. Um, and I was like, what's going on? And then I saw the, um, the respiratory therapist was there because he was having a hard time breathing. And, um, the respiratory therapist came on and said, um, he's having a hard time. And we, and this was the one thing that we had talked about actually driving you to the hospital was, We'll let them do these certain things, but the vent, we really wanted to stay away from the vent. And I think both of us had an extreme fear of the vent. Like that was the thing, you know, like you on the vent, you die. So I think for me, it was just that my biggest fear was was reality. <clears throat> and um, the respiratory therapist says, we, we need to put him on the vent to try and save his life. And um, we'll wait so that you can come and see him because I hadn't hugged his neck all of September. Um, and I guess they figured he wasn't contagious anymore. And so they were going to, I think, I was under the impression they were going to let me see him and hug him. So I'm on the phone and the respiratory therapist is there. And all of a sudden, he, you, he took the phone from you and put it down. And then all of a sudden, all I could hear was noises and lots of doctors or nurses or whoever in the room and like they were doing something to him I could hear but I couldn't see because they put the phone up and then I was just waiting and and praying and hopeful that Mark would come back on the phone and then all of a sudden the phone just it, it somebody hung it up I guess a nurse realized that I was hearing what they were doing and um a couple minutes later I get a phone call from I can't remember if it was a nurse or a doctor and said that that they were going to need to to put you on the vent, but that I could come and still see you before um, before they put you on the vent. They weren't putting you on it yet, and that's when I headed out and got the girls settled, and he was heading to the hospital. And I got a phone call, and they were like, um, "You don't need to hurry. We had to um, put them on the vent, and so just take your time." So I remember pulling into the, the parking lot and just making phone calls and saying, like, they put him on the vent, please pray. Um, and so then I turned around and went home and because I knew I would need snacks and water bottle and, you know, a sweater and whatever because I had, I had just left because um, I had wanted to get there before they, they put him on the vent. Um, so I went home, got all my stuff, realizing that it could be hours that I would be spending at the hospital. Took my time and got to the hospital, and it, by this point, I don't know how long it had been. It had been over an hour, um, and I got to the... They had transferred him to the CTICU, which is the heart um, ICU, Cardi cardiac... Um, Cardiothoracic. Yeah, uh, floor, yeah. Um, because his heart was skyrocketing. 180. And they, yeah, and they couldn't... They couldn't get his heart rate down. Apparently that's not sustainable. 180 beats a minute. Yeah. So that's why he was moved because he was no longer contagious for COVID. And now they had this heart problem. Um, and his body was just fighting that hard um, to, to survive. And so I remember sitting there waiting in the, in the hallway because they don't really have anywhere for you in the CTICU. There's really nowhere for people to sit 
um, unless you're outside and then there's a waiting room there. But I was in the hallway waiting um, to, to be able to see him. But when I walked in, I could see like, there's just all these doctors and nurses surrounding his bed. Like I could hardly even see him through all the people. And um, I think that's when it hit me how serious it was because I'm in the ICU and there's all these doctors and nurses and they weren't just standing, you know, each one was doing something and I'm sure they knew what they were doing, obviously. Mm. Each one had a job and they were doing their thing and so one of the nurses was so kind and sat me down the hallway. And um, so I'm sitting there waiting. And all of a sudden I hear a nurse. And she's like, do you want the cart? And I was like, holy cow, that's a crash cart. Like, that's that's his heart. Like, what's going on? Like, that's legitimately life-threatening now, right? Like, we are at a point where they're going to shock his heart. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that it was because it was so high. They were trying to um, shock it, you know, to get it back into a regular rhythm. Um, I thought at the moment that it was that he was, his heart wasn't beating, right? But, um, I mean, either one, it's equally bad. But anyway, so that, that was September 21st. And then eventually they let me in to see him um, hooked up to all all these machines and 14 IV bags, all these IV bags at, yeah. at the beginning. And it was just, and then that I've was never done drugs, but I did a lot that day. Yeah. Well, and it <coughs> got worse. And, and, um, that was the next four weeks he was on, um, on that. And they try, they tried different things. Thankfully they never did remdesivir because, um, by the time he was admitted, it had been past the point where they typically did that. So we didn't have that. Um, but when he was in the bed or in the ICU there, um, the next day they were going to flip him because they said sometimes that can help, like with the lung, clear the lungs. I think they leave you for like 24 hours or whatever, and then they flip you back. And, and if it helps, then they do it again. And they only did it one time, and they were like, it, it didn't. And it's a dangerous um, procedure because... They don't have a machine. It's it's literally doctors and nurses that lift him dead weight <laughs> with all the tubes and everything, IVs and everything, and they flip him. For the next few weeks, he was on that and yeah. not, not awake at all. And then around the middle of October, um, they were like, he's been on the vent this long. Um, we need to give him um, a G-tube because you know, he was lo losing a lot of weight. I lost 52 because, pounds. Um, yeah. At F this 52. point... I've gained back a bunch. But. <laughs> um, at that point, they had just been giving him nutrition through the IV, and they were like, we can't... That's not enough. We can't get enough calories into him, to, to and he needs that to fight. Um, so they were going to... And they were like, these are just um, the G-tube and the trach. Pick line. And the pick line. Oh, yeah. the No, the pick line was... Oh, so I, sorry, I have to go back. So the pick line was September 21st as well. And that was, um, they were going to do a, a pick vein in the neck because it was going to be, um, they obviously realized it was going to be a while and, or potentially, and um, a lot of IVs, right? And so they were going to do that. And she uh, nicked his carotid oh, artery puts, in, puts a needle into my carotid artery yeah <laughs> directly into his Oops. carotid artery in his neck and he had been on blood thinners at this point um because of covid one of the symptoms is was blood clots or is blood clots and so it's in his carotid artery in his neck and he's on blood thinners and so they left it she left it in trying to figure out what to do um because if she pulled it out he could bleed to death I didn't know this on that day, obviously, but later they realized that while she was waiting to figure out what to do, he had multiple strokes. Mm -hmm. So um, now we have we have COVID, we have this heart thing because mm -hmm. his heart wasn't handling it well, and strokes. So that happened the day that the twenty first when he got moved into the ICU. 
the Carter, the, the strokes, which we didn't know until later. And then October, the middle of October, that's when they wanted to do the, the G tube and the, the, um, trach. And they were like, these are very minimal risk surgeries. They were just going to do them in his hospital room because they said that there's less risk of infection if they do it in the room where he's in than if they take him to a operating room. And so it was just going to be a short while and then they should be done. And I think they would told me even like an hour for both surgeries and, and it shouldn't be a big deal. And for me, again, I was like, the trach scared me a lot more than the, the, you know, G tube. Um, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and, and finally one of the sweetest nurses ever, Ellie, mm -hmm. um, she came and she's like, they got the trach and it's done and it's in, um, but he's having a hard time getting the the tube G tube in. And do you want to see it? And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> and so I went and I saw them, but I heard the doctor and he was like, why did you do that there? And he he sounded a little, I don't know, if frustrated is the word, but I could tell right away that things were not going like he was used to them going. So I watched it a little bit and I saw them in there trying to place the tube and went back and kept praying and it took a while and finally the nurse came back and said, they can't get it, they're going to have to go to the ER. Um, so the trach had been done in his room but they were still going to end up having to go to the ER and, and do an operation there. Mm -hmm. And so then they did and it took a while and apparently something the doctor had never seen before, which is not very comforting when the surgeon is telling you that the procedure they're doing on their husband, something happened and he had never seen, had that issue before and he couldn't get the, the tube out. Like they put it in and then they put whatever, I don't know exactly how it works, but he couldn't get it out. And he had pushed, he said, he told me, he's like, I pushed harder than I was comfortable with. And I'm like, why did you do that? But anyways, then the next day he was really his breathing and everything was worse, mm -hmm. and that's when they placed. Um, they discovered that you had your both your lungs had um, collapsed, and so right around this time was also when they're trying to wake him up, and so this is when you had all the the crazy dreams because they were trying to wake you up, mm -hmm. and um, and you were placed with two um, chest, chest tubes, tubes, huge chest tubes. Yeah, so, so yeah, they were big, and so when I woke up. And people ask me like, "What's it like waking up from a coma?" And I'm like, "Well, let's let's first back it up. It's not a typical like you coma in the movies, you know, where someone like pops up and it's like, hey, 'Hey, I'm, I'm back.' You know, it's um, it's especially when you're coming off all those medications, and they had paralyzed me with medical medicine so yeah. that I wouldn't fight the ventilator. So when I woke up, I literally couldn't move, um, not even a bit, not, not my even my fingers like I was completely paralyzed and it, it's like a really slow realization that you're conscious like even consciousness is a thing um it was I didn't even re I couldn't even register the things that we just take for granted every day like people um at that point in time it was just breathing yeah. um that was all that was on my mind when I woke up um, although the nurse said the first thing when I came to, um, I said, where's my wife? Um, I, um, needed, needed to find out where Kathy was and the kids. Um, and then they started telling me, um, when they realized that they could like communicate with me and I, oh, yeah, that was awesome. um, <laughs> it was, they were, I guess, I don't know if they do this for everybody, but they were explaining as much as they could what had happened to me and they were like Mr. Hyde you were you've been on the ventilator for four weeks and um, you're breathing on a machine um, you have a hole in your throat a trach a trach right here that guy and you have tubes in your lungs and you're paralyzed and you're not going to be able to move your arms um, or your legs um, you can't won't be able to lift your head it's okay um, we're taking care of you. Um, and it's just a lot, you know, when you're coming out of consciousness, unconsciousness into like semi-consciousness, it's just a lot. And um, 
up to that point, I had been having, as they've started to bring me out of the medically induced coma, um, I had just had the craziest dreams you could imagine. Uh, I still remember the, a lot of them two years later, um, where you just, it's like someone's trying to kill you, basically. Um, almost every single one of them was, I, w I felt like I was in danger. It was like the worst anxiety I've ever felt in my life. Um, the darkest feelings I've ever had in my life. And of course, every little thing, breathing, hurt. And I, had, I was on a lot of drugs. Like they had a nerve blocker and all kinds of stuff to, and they gave me like anti-anxiety medicine and anti-anxiety medicine and, and that and stuff for those you know side effects and it was it was a lot of stuff and I, I wanted to get off that as soon as I could and because I didn't think they were helping at all the anxiety was absolutely no. nuts well and some of those mm -hmm. were I think were the cause of your crazy dreams like your mm -hmm. hallucinations and oh, your yeah. dreams were because of the drugs it, him they were weaning him off I the was drugs on and so it, many it. It was really messing mentally yeah. with your brain. Just, so we, um, so that was like the start of, I mean, I, I woke up, like, praise God, right? Like, a lot of people did. Well, I guess we should go back, too, because earlier, the one doctor um, was like, he, like, I asked if we could be transferred, if or if he could be transferred to uh, UVA, because my son... Um, had had researched and was like mom the um the heart department or cardiac department at lynchburg general isn't that great their reviews aren't that at that not that good he's a researcher um and he's like but i researched and he's like uva is really good like could we try and and transfer him there and so um, this was before he was obviously starting to wake up. And so we were still not sure if he was going to survive or not. And so for me as a parent, I kind of felt like I needed to do whatever I could um, so that I could tell my kids that I had done everything for their dad. And with my son asking, you know, it was kind of like, I'll try. And so I talked to the doctors and the one was basically like, you know, I understand how you want to do everything so that when he dies, um, you can tell your kids that you've done everything, you know? Um, but he was very, he was, I found out later, he was an atheist. Um, but he was very resigned to the fact that Mark was going to die. And I actually told him, I said, like, I said, I, I am not giving up hope. He is still breathing. And I believe that God is the, the giver and the taker of life. And at this point, God has not yet taken his life. And so I'm not going to give up hope. And even if you say that it doesn't matter what I do or what you do, um, that nothing's going to make a difference, like he's still going to die. I was like, God is bigger than that. And God can do a miracle. He can do a miracle. I believe in miracles. And he was kind of like, well, whatever, you're crazy. Um, but I was like, no, and until God says his time is up, I'm going to. I'm going to have this hope and this belief that God can do it. And um, he he was like, well, whatever, like, I'll do it to appease you. But it's not, basically, he was like, it's not going to change the outcome. Like, he's still going to die. Hmm. Um, and But anyway, so he did. They tried. Um, they put a request in, or at least I, I was told they did, put a request in at UVA, and they denied um, the, denied the request and said that, there was nothing that they could do there that they weren't already doing for him here. In the end, it was good because I was more easily able to to visit him. You know, our church was amazing. Our church, our friends, so amazing. God used so many people that I didn't even know that stepped up and allowed um, me to be able to go and visit him every single day, which had he been transferred to UVA, I probably wouldn't have been able to um, do that. Um, but our church was amazing. Our church family and our friends were amazing to mm -hmm. just step in and do all the things to yes. make that possible. They are amazing. It was, it was huge. But going back to your dreams and stuff, the, the evilness, like there was an evil presence, um, 
in that hospital room. And I don't know if it had to do with the hospital in general that there's spiritual warfare or, or if it was because that doctor was an atheist, but I just could feel that heaviness when I walked into his room. And one day I was like, no more. I raised my hands. I'm sure they thought I was crazy because I just raised my hands like this. And I just denounced Satan and prayed the blood of Jesus over him and over his room. And, and we started playing uh, Christian music. And even other people that were coming in, I had people, um, I don't know whose idea it was. I think it was uh, Dawn or April, I don't know, um, made this list for me where people could come and pray over Mark and, and read scripture to him when I wasn't there. And, and just the whole, the feeling and the spiritual heaviness was gone after that. I know he was fighting a physical battle, but there was a spiritual one going on yeah. at the same time. And God just showed up in so many ways. And I know he's always there and we know that, but just to have a front row seat was amazing. Yeah. Not, I would never want to go through that again, but God, God is real and God shows up mm -hmm. and is there for you. Like, Every yeah. step of the way, I've never felt closer to the Lord than I did while He was in the hospital. When I was waking up and everything was going on with uh, anxiety and everything, there were times like you, I wondered where God was. I'm just gonna be really honest. Mm -hmm. uh, like I was like, "Where are you, Lord? Like, why am I going through this?" And um, but you know, He never, never left me. He never fus forsook me. He promised He would never, and He did never. Mm -hmm. It's just our emotions. We can't trust them all the time. And I, I guess I would encourage people that if you're going through a really hard time and it seems like it's super dark and that you're all alone, you're not, don't trust that. Like That's the enemy and that's your flesh. And it's just trying to discourage you um, because the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. And, and he was there with me. And there were some times of such intimate closeness with the Lord, when you come through, like for me, like what was heavily impressed upon me as I realized, I, I, I so when I woke up, I, I thought I was going to live. There were some times where things were, were kind of bad and there was complications well, we had ups where, and I downs. Was, where I was yeah. concerned, but I was like committed to living, if that makes sense. I was like, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here the rest of my life in a bed. Um, I'm good. I'm, we're going to do this thing. We're going to get better. And and I knew that. I know people were praying for me, and um, and I learned that there were thousands of people praying for me. Like the news had gone out, and people were telling Kathy about how their faith was being uh, reinforced or encouraged because of what God was doing mm -hmm. in my life, and thousands of people. And it was humbling to me because I, I work in, a, in higher education and ministry and, um, and I, you know, I do my best as I can for the Lord. Um, but there is so much more glory being going to the Lord through me doing nothing and being in a hospital bed and, and his, his power and his glory being shown in the situation than anything I think I've ever done in my life. Um, and it just kind of showed even more that when we're weak, God is infinitely strong. It was so humbling to be used in that way by the Lord. Um, people were being encouraged. I would have nurses come into my room and I'd be like, why are you here? Because <laughs> usually nurses, they want something. Okay, so they want blood or they want to take a temperature or hook you up to something. Um, and, but they would just sit at my bed and they'd say, I just need to see a miracle. And it was a hard time for nurses. Like, they lost a lot of people. Yeah, they did. And so they would come, and they would just sit there with me. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them that Jesus loved them. Everybody that came yeah, in my did. room. <laughs> it didn't matter if it was an x-ray tech or if it was the lady cleaning up after me or um, washing the floors. Everybody heard that Jesus loved them. My question to them was, do you know how much Jesus loves you? And that was a, 
a hopefully a disarming question because sometimes like do you believe in God as people are like oh but just ask people like do you know how much Jesus loves you and some people would think about that and I would have some good conversations as much as I was able with uh, everything going on with this thing and how they had to, oh, whoops they had to cap it like I had to put like with stuff on it so I could talk or not talk and I could only talk a limited amount but everyone except for two people um and it still haunts me that I didn't tell those people that Jesus loved them. But everybody got to know Jesus loved them. And, um, you know, it's things that the Lord revealed to me coming out of that situation. Things that I learned, things that he taught me that I want other people to know is, number one, Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you know. He loves you more than you'll ever know. Um, he loves you in whatever situation you're in. He has not left you. He loves you. He also, he didn't even, and for me, he told me, and it's, I'm not going to say it was an audible voice, but it was very much a, a strong uh, impression and like a voice in my, in my heart, if, if you will. One was that he still had work for me to do. And this, is, this one has stuck, and it's, these two have stuck with me ever since the hospital. Um, and is don't waste it. Don't waste it. And so um, the the breath in my lungs is very precious to me. I have a deep connection to breathing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the feeling of a full exhale and a full inhale. And when I get anxious, I do it just to feel my lungs expand because it's so it's so awesome. But Every breath I have is another minute to glorify the Lord. Every single one. And I encourage people, I even encourage them at work, I encourage my students when I'm talking to them, that if the Lord has given you another breath today, then you just take that moment and glorify the Lord. And that helps you get centered. Because you can be so easily overwhelmed by so many things in life. And um, if you can breathe, you can glorify the Lord. And... Um, the breath in your lungs is there for a reason. And and the other thing the Lord impressed on me from that whole situation is that we exist for his glory. That's it. There is no other reason we're around. All creation is for God's glory. Everything that we do is for him. Um, and this world is, is, is fleeting. This time we have, our lifespan is, is the concept of our lifespan is like, in, in, in light of eternity is so brief. Um, everything that we have and everything we do needs to be about him because one day we'll be with him. If you love Jesus and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you under, and have confessed that you're a sinner and you've asked Jesus to come and cleanse you of that sin, that his blood has covered your sin and you are saved and you are under the blood of Christ and your, your role now is to glorify him um, in anything you do. And that has completely changed my perspective on life. Um, and I, I try to encourage people, you know, I don't want people to have to go through what I went through to get to that point. I walked with the Lord all my life. I got saved at a young age. Um, long series of long long process of sanctification right like just getting there getting closer to the lord getting there um and this was like fast forward it was a complete change in how i approach pretty much everything um in life uh, and so jesus loves you and use what the time you have to glorify him because there's no greater purpose than that all right jumping back to the recovery, um, inpatient, uh, in the hospital therapy, in the hospital room. Learn so I, I didn't just have one stroke, I had three. Um, and so my right hand was slow coming back. But look at that. It's still, um, it's still I, not I still don't have all the coordination. But... Every time I, when I'm typing, and the typing is a lot of my work, sometimes I just hit the wrong key. Well, and that's okay. I think you need to go back, go back to where... Um, I don't know if you said this, but where they um, 
when you were waking up and they told you what was going on and, and it was so overwhelming. But then it was overwhelming because they told you like all the things. And I, and I know that they have to tell you like, um, what you may not be able to do. And they didn't know because he had, he was one of the only people at that point that had survived yep. that length of time on event plus the stroke. Um, and so they didn't know what his recovery was going to look like, but that overwhelming feeling of when they were like, you're barely awake and you may never walk again. You may never talk again. You may never eat again on your own. You may never move your arms. You may never, you may never this, you, you know, every little thing that you can think that we just take for granted. Like you may never breathe on your own again. Like yep. you may always have to have oxygen. You may always have the trait. Like you may always have to eat through a tube. Through a, yes. Like all these things that they were saying that potentially, because mm -hmm. they didn't know and they didn't want to give him false hope. And for that, I'm thankful. But it was just, I think for you, very daunting. Um, not even really having the ability or the, the capability or capacity to to think that far because at that point it was just breathing like that was the number one thing and that took all his focus and concentration and energy at that point and then to be told that you may never do all these things was was super yeah. super daunting and that and that's part of the whole the miracle thing like i just i don't want to just gloss over it because it was like the lord gave him back every single thing and that is only god that yeah. is and and it's a miracle and and i don't want to i i don't want to just be like oh it's just a miracle like no the creator of the world came and touched his life in not just one area not just hey i'm gonna let you breathe on your own I'm going to let you move your hands again. I'm going to let you eat again. I'm going to let you walk again. I'm going to let you see. That was the other thing. Part of the stroke um, was the part of the, um, it went into the part of the brain where um, your vision is. Mm -hmm. And the other part was your right, your right hand, your uh, fine motor skills and all those different things. And God touched every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Like he said, your right arm or right finger um, or right hand, I guess yeah. your right hand function isn't a hundred percent. It's my, it was. it's my reminder. I can't, it gets mm -hmm. a little numb, not numb. Numb's not the right word, but it doesn't feel the same as these, these fingers do. That's all I can say. God touched every single thing that, mm -hmm. that, was an ailment and and he and healed you like mm -hmm. the and i think that sometimes we take that so for granted mm -hmm. but it's like the creator of the world like think of all the millions of people in the world and he came to lynchburg virginia jesus i mean he's here all the time and i think we forget that too as believers that jesus is here if you have asked him into your life like he is with you and he fights our battles. Mm -hmm. And that is something that he did in those that hospital room. So many times I cried out to the Lord and it was like, God, I, I can't, the doctors can't. And 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 I even like shared with people like the doctors and nurses can't do it unless God says, mm -hmm. I will allow this medicine to work or this procedure to work. It's all the Lord, all of it. Does he give us wisdom and knowledge? to know how to do certain procedures or certain medicines to help you? Yes, but it all comes directly from the Lord and that and and he is the one and we just have to be willing and available to allow the Lord to use us and that like Mark was not even conscious and the Lord was using him and and I think that that's something as believers we sometimes forget. Like, oh, what's this thing that the Lord's going to do? I don't, I don't have this, or I don't have that skill, or I can't. The Lord can't use you. Yes, He can. If you are willing, the Lord will use you. You just have to be willing. Yeah. Willing and available, and God will use you. Yeah. It may not be in this magnificent way that you might dream. It might be this horrible, horrible medical journal journey or a horrible other journey. But if you stay close to the Lord and you allow him, he will use you and he will be honored and glorified. And God did that. Mark was was available. <laughs> um, not had, what we would have no, chosen. I had nowhere to go. <laughs> right? Um, but he used you. I mean, there was people 
literally all over the world. We had people in Africa, people in Belize, Canada, I don't know where else, all over praying for, for him. And so many people said to me, and or to their friends or whoever, and then it came back and they told me was how their life was changed or drawn, they were drawn closer to the Lord because of what Mark was going through. And so that's the other thing I want people just to remember is that when you're going through a hard time, it might not be because of you. You know, God might be allowing you to be going through that to encourage or have somebody else grow closer to the Lord. And so I think that's just for us, or for me at least, it was a good reminder mm -hmm. that this is not about us. This was about the Lord showing himself to thousands yeah. of people. Yeah, it's, it's very humbling to be used by the Lord like that and to be allowed to live because I know a lot of people did, and I deal with that. Mm -hmm. Often I meet people when I share my testimony at different places, and they're like, "I, my dad didn't make it or my husband didn't make it. And I'm sitting here going, Lord, why did I? Um, but even in, in that, their situation, both of them shared and others have shared, even in their, them losing their loved one, um, the Lord worked through that and never left them. Mm -hmm. And, and so God is, God uses any, anything, even the tragedy for his glory. And I, I, I do praise God that I, I got to hold my grandchild a couple of days, a week or two ago, my first grandchild. Um, and that was not lost on me that I almost missed that. While I would have been with the Lord, um, they would have been without me. And it, so it's just a blessing to be there. I mean, we don't need to go into all the details and everything else. But um, in the hospital, I had to learn how to swallow again, um, mm -hmm. use my hands. I didn't use my right hand for a long time. I learned to eat with my left hand, do everything with my left hand, even though I'm not left-handed. Um, and then my right hand came back and then it was sitting up and then it was standing up mm -hmm. and then it was my first couple steps with a walker with all the tubes still hooked up to me and then learning how to do everything again. Cause yeah. when you're atrophied for, um, for after that long on a ventilator, your body just loses everything. So the Lord is good and we just kept at it and like Kathy said, like, it was discouraging to hear all those things that I might never do again, and it was. But I don't know, the Lord just gave me a, a resistance. I was like, no, I will. <laughs> I will do these things again. And he allowed me to. He did. He did. And it's him. It took a long <laughs> time and a lot of work. So after leaving the hospital December 22nd, no, yeah, mm -hmm. December 22nd, we got out of the hospital. Um, three months-ish of rehab. From like in home to outpatient. I think you ended in like April or May. Yeah, so for four, outpatient, three four months therapy. Um, got back to work. Um, first work from home and then in the office, and I'm still there, working yeah. for the Lord at at the university, and and um, God is good. Yeah, God is so good. And uh, yeah. a lot of perspective, you know, like those little arguments, they don't mean so much anymore. Um, those little hiccups in life, they don't mean so much anymore. Um, if you have breath in your lungs, you can serve the Lord. I and he's always there. That's mm -hmm. That was another thing that I learned was this was fairly early on and it looked really bleak. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think it was like right around the time when they discovered that you had the strokes because then it was like, even if he does get off the vent, we don't know what the, what the damage of the stroke will be. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was just curled up crying out to the Lord. I was in a fetal position and uh, on the bottom of the shower and I was just crying out to the Lord and he, again, not in an audible voice, but he just spoke to me and he was like, you're going to be okay. And this peace that he says he will give, I will give you peace that the world doesn't understand, you know, that peace so that, passes only, that passes understanding, yeah, that only God can give. Mm -hmm. That, I felt that peace. And I heard him say, you're going to be okay. And it felt, 
it felt like he was literally there, you know, like he was, I was in his presence. And like I said, at that point, I didn't know, I didn't know if he was going to live. I didn't know if he was going to be disabled. I didn't know. But what I did know was that no matter what, whether he died or lived and was disabled or whatever, I was going to be okay. And he was going to be okay. And my kids were going to be okay. God was going to take care of us. And and there's just a peace in that knowing and and it is like like the bible says like it's it's beyond understanding like i can't explain it but it was just yeah mm-hmm. it was real it, god is mm-hmm. always there with you you mm-hmm. just have to be still yeah and he and he, you will hear him mm-hmm. that's and he will use you if you're willing if you're willing if you're willing. God can use you in the most unusual ways when you're um, weak. So I was the weakest I'd ever been, right? Like hooked up to everything, couldn't move, couldn't even move my arms. Um, somehow I could talk at that point. I was one of the, so I was off, probably off the bed by then. Um, and I was, I'll share, I'm going to share one of my dreams, okay? One of the dreams that I had. So I was having this dream and I would, it was a weird dream. I was in a hospital bed, surprise, surprise, in the dream. And in the room, was um, it was a storm outside. It was a big storm, lots of thunder, lightning, completely black outside the room. It was a room with windows, and the windows were shattered. So the, wa- the, wa- the, wa- the rain, the rain. <laughs> that he does that sometimes. The Still rain from and the, the wind. Stroke sometimes. The rain and the wind. Um, I could. It's like I could feel them. That's how this dream was, and it was the worst, darkest wave of anxiety I I remember feeling. It was absolutely horrible. And this is in this dream. It was just, and I was looking around for help, and there was no nurse in sight. And all of a sudden. In my dream, a man walked into the room, and um, I recognized him. And he sat next to my bed, and he started to read out of the Bible. He took a, took a Bible, and he started reading. And I don't remember exactly what verse it was, but it was the Psalms. I knew that. And he had this deep voice. <laughs> it's Jonathan from yeah. church. He came to see me quite a bit. Um I didn't know that at the time that it was actually happening, like not the storm, but he did come in my room um, well, and you... do this. But anyways, um, I was, um, he started reading the Psalms and as he did in my dream, the storm calmed, it just stopped. It was peaceful and it was almost like there was light and he just read the Psalms. And in my dream, a nurse came in, and I, I, I shared the gospel with him in my dream. I shared the gospel, and I talked to him about his walk with the Lord, and I encouraged him as best I could. And this is all in my dream. This is all happening in a dream. And later on, after this dream was over, you told me. Jonathan that, came no, back to visit me. Well, you told me. You were like, I had this crazy dream. And I was like, that wasn't a dream. Jonathan told me he had been visiting you, and the nurse came in, and you wouldn't let the nurse go. So it wasn't a dream. It was reality. It, like, it but, happened. Right, <laughs> but that's just how awesome God is, because I didn't know. I In my mind, that was a dream. It wasn't even real, and I was unconscious, like, semi-conscious unconscious yeah you were yeah you were in the coming and, out phase and, and jonathan was like mark no that happened i i was there and and he says the funny thing is is he want that nurse was trying to get out of there so bad <laughs> and you just would not let him leave yes. because you were going to make sure that he was saved before he left the room and i was like wow because in my in my recollection of that dream that's what it was but even in that moment the Lord just did so much, right? Who does that? Like, how, how does it even work that in a semi-conscious state you share the gospel? Huh. Well, I mean, it I was just... I don't how that works. It, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's the... It's... God is amazing. Like, 
there is just, I think in that room, there was just the presence of the Lord. Like I even had, I only met her one time and that was the dietitian, which I was like, oh, he has a dietitian. I didn't know that. Like they're feeding him through a G-tube, I guess, because the G-tube, she's the one who was saying how much calories or whatever. But anyways, she's like, yeah, I just come in here because it, I, I, it, it lifts me up to come in and hear the Christian, because we had a... Worship music. We're Equip FM. <laughs> Yay! Um, but yeah, we I had Equip FM playing in his room instead of like the TV or anything else, and I thought it might ca- calm him down. And so, and they said the nurses were like, he can he, potentially. They say, you know, in your unconscious, you can still hear. And um, so I wanted something uplifting for him to hear instead of all just all the beeping and all the mm-hmm. drama from all the other. I ICU. hate heart monitors to this day. Heart monitors are annoying. Yeah, but like even her, like I I saw her one time. He was obviously not interacting with her because he was unconscious, but she could sense the spirit of the Lord in that room and was coming <clears throat> just for like that. And she was a believer, obviously, but like she said, or she said at least that she was a believer. So, but it's still like she could sense the spirit of the Lord there. And so he's there. Like it just blows my mind to think of how. God cares so much for us. And we know that as believers, but then to see it in person, you know, like with this lady coming and feeling the spirit of the Lord and is like, yeah, I want to be there. I want to be where the Lord is. And used you yeah. again. Yeah, it just used, it, it wasn't even me. Right. I didn't do anything. You I, th- were I think I was probably <laughs> the mo- most effective in ministry when I couldn't do anything at all. Literally nothing at all, not even move. And the Lord was working, so. Well, isn't that how it's supposed to be, though? Yeah. The Lord is supposed to be yeah. do. We're supposed to just be available and, the, yeah. and allow the Lord to, yeah. to do. And it constantly reminds me that the strength that God gives me now, you have to ask that question, like, why is God giving you strength? If he can do so much through your weakness, if he did so much through my weakness, why does he give us strength? Right? And I, I, I do I, I keep that in my mind when I do feel when I do ministry now. I remember okay, when I so- got my t-shirt, I was in the, <laughs> I was getting ready to leave the hospital room um, at Virginia Baptist, getting ready to leave and my wife comes in with your friend. They gave me a haircut. Um, I was pretty shaggy and uh, they're like, here wear this. And I'm like, Okay, like I was a little lighter so, than this. But. So the the story behind this is all things are possible, or with man, things are not possible. With God, all things are possible. Um, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew 19. Um, but the this t-shirt came in, or that verse, was because um, I would do an update, and there's a, a Facebook page, actually, that April um, Allen from church so she was so amazing and put it together and so she kind of um kept everybody kind of in the loop because it was just a lot for me hundreds of people yeah and you know people are emailing me and or texting me or whatever calling and hey how's mark and wanting updates and this was it started early on she was like why don't i start this page to keep people informed and then you just send it to me and then you don't have to send it to all these people and it's just it took a huge weight off of me and so I would write um, these things every night I would send an update and sometimes if there was like you know he had that emergency whatever surgery the, for the tube or whatever they would call or whatever um, then I would do multiple updates in a day but generally once a day I would update and um in my writing, it just naturally, I would say, but God did this or whatever. And so that ended up being a thing. Um, and people are like, you keep saying, but God. And I'm like, well, it is God, you know, without. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why in the middle it says, but God. Um, so it came out of that, out of the writings. And then the verse is just like, with man, things are impossible, but, but God, you know, but with God, all things are possible. Um, and so that's where the verse came from. Yep. And um, the longer he was in the hospital, 
you know, first we had hoped he'd come home in September back for Willow's birthday, which is September 19th, and that didn't happen. And that was even before he was on the ventilator. And then we were hoping Thanksgiving, and that didn't happen. Um, and then we were hoping Christmas, and and the doctors and nurses worked with us, and he worked really hard. to. He had to be able to walk up the steps to our, get into ten, our home. My goal was 10 steps. I had to make it up 10 steps. To be able to be discharged. Yeah. Um, and so that was the goal. Um, cause we had, we had a bed and a bathroom on the main floors and the kitchen so he could get to what he needed to. Um, so that was the goal to get him home. And then somebody, I think Stacy came up with the idea, we should do a shirt and, um, have everybody line the street for when he comes home. And so if you ever want to watch a video, uh, Jonah did a video for us. So, Homecoming, so precious, yeah. um, to me. And I'm so thankful to him for doing that. Um, but so we made these shirts and whoever wanted to buy a shirt could buy a shirt. And so there's a video and there's people literally lined. I don't know how many people lined yeah, a, down our over, street over 100 for sure. um, on the day. And he didn't know yeah. um, on the day that I he came home. Yeah. Um, and and so we just drove in and there's all these people just mm-hmm. praising the Lord um, that yeah. he he survived. And so that's what these shirts are. Yeah. Or from that. And then on the yeah. back, it says, um, can't stop, won't stop. I was texting my sister, obviously, a lot. And she was like, I'm like, keep praying. And she's like, can't stop, won't stop. And so that, and so that again, it was just this organic thing that just um, was born through the, the, um, the updates and the praying and asking yeah. people to pray. Yeah. And you, and, so. and you know that when I went, it was just recovering and just learning how to do everything all over again. And the therapist was coming to see me all the time, uh, occupational and physical, and they would take turns and they would come in. I never turned them away. And they said that no, that some days I was the only person of all of their clients that actually wanted to do therapy. And I couldn't believe that. I'm like, why in the world do you not want to get it better? You know? I wanted to get home. That goal, that December twenty seventh, that 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 before Christmas goal, um, man. I wasn't going to turn any therapy away. Yeah, you know, no. But it's I, hard. Yeah, that's what I want to say. It just is. wanted to say, and and this might never make it, but um, I just wanted to say, um, if you're in the hospital, and and the therapist comes, do your therapy. <laughs> Do your therapy because God's going to give you the strength you need. You just have to trust. Um, even if you can't stand on your own two feet, hmm. um, which I couldn't, the Lord will hold you. Sometimes he might use nurses to do that. but um, Boy, they were strong they nurses were strong. They got <laughs> the first time they did. But, um, yeah. <laughs> they were holding you. But God, right? But God, yeah. But God. So many but God's. Well, and that's, yeah, and that's where it was born from because there was so many times in those updates. And if you go look at that page, you'll see like, but God, and it was, God did so many things. I mean, we could sit here literally all day and tell you all the things that the Lord did, um, throughout the stay and just showed, showed himself so many times. Like you, if you see the story and if you were part of that story or people that knew us or knew of the situation, you had to make a point of saying, I'm going to deny the Lord. If you said you couldn't see the Lord in it because God showed himself so many times in so many ways and so evident. It was just, it was, you had to say that was the Lord. There was just, you didn't have a different, there's no other reason right? but God. And such a, some of the sweetest times of worship I've ever had was in that hospital bed. Just me and the Lord. Hands up, tears running down my face. Yeah, he showed himself in music. Just music was a grateful, big, grateful. Yeah. Every day is a blessing. Yeah.